Hello, Shinobi and Samurai, my name is Devious Guy, and welcome to Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, the very latest game from FromSoft. As an anticipated game from an acclaimed studio, the internet is going to be inundated with gameplay videos and previews, and I don't really want to compete with that. So, let's do something a little bit different. In this video, we'll be looking at the aesthetics, art direction, and visual design of the opening hours of Sekiro. I say the opening hours because I have spent only about 10 hours with the game at the time of writing, and Sekiro may have much more to show us down the line that I can't cover right now because I keep dying too much to progress in the game. If there is material for it, though, we will do a follow-up video sometime later on. Now, FromSoft being FromSoft, and Soulsborne being an entire genre unto itself, which Sekiro sort of fits into, the comparison with past FromSoft games is going to be inevitable, and I am not going to resist the urge. In fact, holding Sekiro up against Dark Souls and Bloodborne a little bit is not at all a bad way to understand how the game's aesthetics and gameplay seem to inform each other. So, Sekiro is immediately far more colorful than its predecessors. Where the Dark Souls games have a tendency to rely on various shades of grey, brown, orange, yellow, and blue for a lot of their color identity, Sekiro not only has a somewhat, although not aggressively, more saturated natural color palette, but it brings in pinks, purples, whites, and greens. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying that Dark Souls doesn't have any greens in it, or that Sekiro doesn't have any browns, but that the games balance the use of those colors very differently. As compared with Bloodborne, where Bloodborne is very fond of high contrast, stark environments, Sekiro goes with a somewhat more washed out, slightly faded look, which ends up looking somewhat more naturalistic. In fact, a lot of the outdoor daytime scenes feature light pink and reddish hues washing over the environment, especially in sunlight, giving the scene an almost watercolor-esque look. Nature is a key part of the comparison here, by the way. Previous Soulsborne games, aesthetically, have tended to be walking tours through broken human societies featuring some occasional nature, often in the form of overgrowing plant life reclaiming abandoned human edifices. In Sekiro, however, you spend almost as much time sneaking through nature as you do castles and buildings, and the human civilization you pass through often coexists much more comfortably with nature than the paved cities and grand crumbling ruins of the game's siblings. Mountainous, forested Japanese countryside is ever-present, interweaving smoothly with the human constructions that litter the landscape. Trees, cliffs, waterways, flowers, bamboo, and gardens are absolutely everywhere. Where Dark Souls' grand architecture seeks to override and dominate nature, Sekiro's coexists with it. Now, partly this has to do with previous Soulsborne games being based in a European dark fantasy and Sekiro being Japanese, and Japan has a different historical architectural tradition, but FromSoft has also clearly been making very deliberate decisions about bringing a lot of lush, natural environments into their scenario design and as part of their environmental storytelling. As for enemy design, the stylistic inclinations of FromSoft show themselves strongly across all of their titles, and Sekiro is no different. They are fond of making the costume designs of even regular enemies elaborate and well-realized. Whether the enemy is a samurai general kitted out in full ceremonial battle armor, or a regular grunt running around nearly naked. Nakedness, by the way, is an interestingly common feature of a number of Sekiro's enemy designs, with especially supernatural enemies like ogres showing a lot of skin, with bodies designed in a way that I find especially reminiscent of the shape language of traditional ukiyo-e woodcut art. Also, like previous FromSoft titles, Sekiro is fond of using relative enemy size as a way to embody the power of threatening enemies. This is, of course, the oldest game design visual trick in the book, but it is fun to notice how even otherwise ordinary human adversaries are rendered several sizes bigger than their protagonists to show their power as elite enemies. With Sekiro being a character story, rather than featuring the customizable silent protagonist of Soulsborne's past, it is also free to direct its story and especially its cutscenes with a very different pathos. This is where I wish I was more immersed in Japanese film history, because a lot of the direction and pacing choices in the game's cutscenes feel familiar to me as someone who has watched a number of Akira Kurosawa movies, but I don't know enough about the history to speak on which traditions, which influences, and which older filmmakers the filmmaking in this game draws on, or indeed how much it draws on it. And speaking of protagonists, let's take a look at him, the wolf. 
Being deprived of the option to let the players engage in fashion souls, FromSoft instead had to design a protagonist looks interesting, unique, and compelling enough to look at for the entire game through hundreds, if not thousands, of deaths. This is more difficult than you'd think, because for a game as brutal and punishing as Sekiro, you need a protagonist who can embody both the perfect, invincible super shinobi tearing through enemies without a care in the world, but also a struggling, desperate lone warrior holding on by the skin of his teeth and suffering brutal beatdown after brutal beatdown. With the wolf, they have struck a fairly solid balance. His clothes are practical and comfortable, but distinctive, which makes him look like a professional in his craft, but they're also worn down and dirty and beaten up. The relatively restrained costume design also helps because it makes his movements and animations as readable as possible. Imagine if he had a long, flowy cape or a big fancy anime scarf, and now imagine the frustration of dying because one of those things blocked your view for a moment or made you confused about what move you were making. His body language says prepared and determined, but not energetic. His signature shinobi prosthetic looks mechanical and practical, but not sleek or cool. Interestingly, his boots are a highlight of his design, being decorated with multiple extra details, which hints visually to his mobility not just in combat, but if you want to be a little bit extra and over-analytical about him, perhaps also a bit of a thematic hint about who he is as a person. He's restless, always on the move, never really at ease, never really you know, resting in a home, but always out traveling, looking for it. I mean, I'm reaching, obviously, but it's interesting to think about. Finally, let's answer a question that some of you may well be asking yourselves at this point. Why does all of this aesthetics business really matter beyond just establishing the setting? Well, FromSoft are quite fond of making their aesthetic inform their style of gameplay and vice versa. Dark Souls' melancholic visual aesthetic pairs well with its deliberate slow pace of lore exposition and its gameplay style. Ditto Bloodborne's high contrast horror aesthetic and much more active gameplay. And Sekiro is no different. It's more colorful and vibrant than any previous FromSoft game and accordingly, its gameplay is also much more aggressive and active. While it's not exactly a comedy, it doesn't share the broken world on the brink of collapse funereal mood of previous games. And as Austin Walker over at Waypoint points out, it's a game set in the middle of a very dynamic, active period in Japanese history, the Sengoku period, where warlords from all over the Japanese Isles are vying for the position of Shogun. It's a time of upheaval and change, but not a time of society in total decay and collapse, rather it's society in total revolution and movement. I mean, still, lots of war, lots of killing, lots of civilians dying and children being left orphaned and stuff like that. Terrible period, but not the kind of huddling around a campfire and trying to find some solace in despair as the world sputters to an ignoble end around you. So the combat asks you to get into the thick of it, to clash, to fight toe to toe, to get into the adrenaline rush of combat. The brighter colors, the living nature, the verticality of the game map, all of these things are working together to sell that concept. And like most things, when it is done right, you're likely to barely even notice how hard it works to pull it off at all. Sekiro is, in short, an absolutely gorgeous game with a fantastic aesthetic, or at least so far, you know, things might fall apart near the end, but I, for one, can't wait to jump back in and see more of it, no matter how many times I might have to die to make that happen. Hey, thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, mutual YouTube stuff, like, comment, subscribe, yada, yada, yada. It all helps, especially comments apparently are good for the algorithm. I don't know. If you want to go down and leave one, I would certainly be grateful for the help. And if you want to help out the channel more directly, then there is Patreon, where you can support with any dollar amount a month that you want, which helps me food, clothes, rent, you know, all of that frivolous stuff. But if you don't want to do the regular recurring subscription thing, I also have a tip jar at Coffee where you can give me, you know, a little tip in $3 increments because, you know, you can buy a coffee for $3 and that's, that's why the name. And you can also donate directly uh, via the Streamlabs link down in the description. Of course, if you're not willing or able to do any of that, it's completely fine. I'm just happy that you've watched the video this far. Uh, I do stream every Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday here on this channel, not on Twitch. Uh, sorry about that, it's here on YouTube. So you can tune into that. We've just finished up uh, most of Hollow Knight, and we're looking for the next game to play. And it looks like it's going to be a close race between Celeste and Okami. So if you're a member of the channel Discord, then you can head on over there, and there's going to be a poll where you can cast your vote for the next game to be played. <sighs> okay, I think that's all of the stuff I'm supposed to be promoting here at the end of the video. So, uh, yeah, 
thank you very much for watching, and uh, if you want to, you can click the dislike button down below if the video wasn't good, and I'm sure that a ninja assassin will not suddenly appear on a rooftop far up above you and jump down into your face, stabbing you before rope darting himself away and immediately falling off a cliff, and then he has to do the whole thing all over again. Fortunately, you get to respawn, and maybe next time he won't target you because he's just so impatient to get to the next part of the map.